If you live in Salt Lake County, the Zoo Arts and Parks, a.k.a. ZAP programs, will be on your ballot this fall. This ad is paid for by the Zoo Arts and Parks Reauthorization and Preservation Committee, and they want you to vote yes to renew ZAP and to return your ballot by November 5th. ZAP funds 232 arts and culture nonprofits, keeps 70 parks, 22 rec centers, and hundreds of miles of trails maintained and open for everyone. You can learn more at renewzap.org. It is time for the Avenue Street Fair. Spend Saturday, September 14th, in one of Salt Lake's most iconic neighborhoods, the Avenues. The fair takes place on 3rd Ave between D and I Street. There will be local food vendors, over 200 booths, a kids' parade, and live music from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Admission is free. There's even a bike valet. No tickets. Just show up. Get all the details at avenuestreetfair.org. Today on CityCast Salt Lake, Amendment D was supposed to be on your ballot, but now it's void. But it's still on your ballot. It's chaos. An executive producer, Emily Means, helps me break it down. Plus, the big debate this week? Surely you mean Utah's candidates for governor on Wednesday night and some easy nature picks of the week to take you into the weekend. It's Friday, September 13th. I'm Allie Vallarta, and here is what Salt Lake's talking about. Emily Means, I have breaking news for you, and it's not what you're thinking. Yeah, I don't know why you keep doing this to me, Allie. Actually, I like it. I'll be honest. I like being in the know. What's the news? So so we're recording this at around 11 a.m. on Thursday. We have obvious breaking news, which we're going to spend most of this episode talking about. But government news is just too much for me right now. And so I wanted to start by sharing some fun news with you, which is that Sundance just released their three finalists to host the future Sundance Film Festival. And they are Cincinnati, Boulder, Colorado, and Salt Lake City and Park City, Utah. Oh my God, what a tease. Like, didn't they just release the previous five finalists? So we're just narrowing and narrowing and narrowing. We're narrowing and narrowing, narrowing. We're in a tornado of doom. Um, I think this is really interesting. I will say there was a piece from Virginia Pierce, the Utah Film Commissioner in Deadline recently, where she described the process of Salt Lake City and Park City bidding for Sundance again as trying to woo back a longtime lover. (laughs) Wow, the drama. Theater people, am I right? (laughs) Honestly. I'm happy about this. It's no secret. I have thought the festival should move to Salt Lake City for almost a decade. So (laughs) I'm pro. But all right, let's get into the breaking government news, which is Amendment D, our old pal, who we've only known for two weeks, and yet we've come to know so well. It was a ballot question that the legislature sent to our ballots, And as of this morning, according to a district court judge, it's void. Allie, this news is crazy. (laughs) This is crazy. (laughs) Okay, first, we need to thank the reporters who are literally waiting until the wee hours of the morning for this decision. So this court hearing happened on Wednesday, and the decision dropped Thursday morning at a normal time. But I Mm -hmm. saw people who were tweeting at like 2 a.m. Like, oh, still nothing. So thanks to you all. Um, But this is huge, Allie. Uh, It's another L for legislative leaders, for Republican leaders, especially in our state. And uh, this all came about because voter advocacy groups challenged the amendment language, which Mm -hmm. we can uh, re-up for y'all. But what they asked for was they either wanted it off the ballot or if it was too late to take it off, they wanted the votes for and against this amendment not to count. And that is what the judge decided on. That's where the judge landed. There were basically two factors, it seems like, in this decision. One, you mentioned the notion that the language is misleading, which seems to be sort of the most important. It seemed to dominate most of the hearing conversation. 
But the second is that the legislature didn't abide a, a requirement in the law, which is that they publish the language of the amendment in newspapers. And shout out to newspapers, <laughs> because I do think the like as much as we have and should like stare down the legislature for trying to sneak all of this past us. I think like, you know, the idea that you should be printing this in the newspaper. It's kind of funny because it's like it feels a little bit antiquated. But then like the oh, legislature yeah. loves antiquated laws when they're using them to justify things like Amendment D, like in their whole case for Amendment D being on the ballot. And we heard this from Governor Cox Wednesday night in the gubernatorial debate was like. They're bringing up the forefathers. They're talking about the Constitution. They're talking about the dawn of freaking time. And then it's like, well, you didn't run it in the newspaper. <laughs> wow. And what newspapers are even left? I think the Tribune is printing once a week now. On Sunday, and I think. On yeah. Sundays. Mm -hmm. So this is a great reason to support your local newspapers. Honestly. And to be sure, like what the state has said to the court is, OK, fine, we'll run it in the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, Amendment D. We just did a show with Salt Lake Tribune columnist Robert Gerke explaining what this thing actually does. Please go listen to that. He gives great context. But just to get everyone on the same playing field, this amendment is about citizen led ballot initiatives and whether the Utah legislature should be able to change them and whether right. they have the power to repeal or change these ballot initiatives. And the language that uh, Senate President Stuart Adams and House Speaker Mike Schultz put on your ballot is, should the Utah Constitution be changed to strengthen the initiative process? Mm -hmm. And it's that strengthen that there is so much contention around. That's what the voter advocacy groups uh, hinge their argument on. And the judge said, yeah, this is misleading. This is this is not clear to voters. Uh, most voters don't have any knowledge of these things before they get to the polling location. And so if they're just going off of this language, yeah, it's not clear what it is that they would be voting for. And when we think about who's taking the L here, I think it's important to be clear that, that really it's Senate President Stuart Adams and Speaker of the Utah House Mike Schultz, both leaders in the Republican supermajority, the veto-proof supermajority that we have at the Utah legislature, there are members of their own party who agree with the judge here, who have right. said in the run-up to all of this, this language is misleading. Um, Republican legislator Ray Ward from Davis County said he thought it read as an advertisement for the amendment, basically. And so... It's like there has been party strife as well. Like it's not just like this judge versus the Utah Republican Party. We even saw Governor Spencer Cox has tried his hardest to avoid having to talk about this thing. <laughs> like he has said very little. Um, and when he was asked about it Wednesday night in the gubernatorial debate, he was kind of still trying not, it felt like, to answer the question totally. So you also get the impression that, like, aside from Mike Schultz and Stuart Adams, there are a lot of people in both parties in the state who think that this language is problematic. But if you are Mike Schultz and Stuart Adams, you're just taking L after L this summer. Like, it has been a long, hot summer for these two dudes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Allie, that is... My next question here, how will our legislative leaders respond to this? Um, we have like an actual quote from them. They're extremely disappointed by mm -hmm. uh, what they call the lower court's policymaking action from the bench. Uh, such interference during an ongoing election undermines public confidence in the integrity of the process. That's a quote from uh, Senate President Stuart Adams and House Speaker Mike Schultz. But I think it's just really interesting to see them continue to try to paint our judges in this state as, you know, as active as being activists and making policy from the bench and undermining the legislature when people should understand that Republican legislators put these judges <laughs> on the bench. You know, Emily like means, in my <laughs> notes, it says 
part where Emily reminds everyone that the Republican <laughs> legislators put these judges right. on the bench. Like these are not these are not like the most uh, you know leftist socialist justices. No. You know we don't we don't have those here. There is we have a very thorough process for nominating judges. Governor Cox nominates judges, and then the Utah Senate approves them. Mm-hmm. Again, supermajority Republican legislature approves proving these Mm -hmm. justices, these judges. And so to see them continue to try to paint them as activist judges when they hand them an L, I mean, maybe they do a little reflection instead and ask why the legislature continues to pass things that are that go against the Constitution. Right. (laughs) You know? Yeah. Maybe a little self-reflection is necessary here. I mean, the issue with passing legislation that is unconstitutional, aside from the fact that it's a waste of time, is that it's also a waste of money, right? Because, like, we as taxpayers pay to have an attorney general, for example, pay for that office. Like, when the state is spending time in court trying to prove that it's that laws that the state legislature has made are not unconstitutional, it's a waste of money. I think it's fiscally irresponsible. And the thing about the judges of it all is that we actually used to have what was considered, and we learned this because on this show, we interviewed a legal scholar from BYU about our judicial appointment and judicial like nomination process in Utah. And he said, Utah is the gold standard. Like the way that we go about it, we had like this committee and there were the bar would appoint seats to the committee and it was nonpartisan and it would like make recommendations and then the, the governor would sign up, whatever. Like we now have a process that I think you could probably describe as silver star because already the legislature has been starting to chip it away, away at it. They're already moving it towards the, just the governor having eyes on these judges, not necessarily taking input from a body, a nonpartisan body of judicial experts. Granted, our governor happens to be a lawyer, Spencer Cox, but like the the way that the state is already moving is to a place where our gold standard judicial nomination process gets more and more tarnished, it seems, every legislative session. And one of the things that that BYU legal scholar told us in that episode that I thought was so interesting, this was, what, a year, a year and a half ago now, was there's a lot of fear in the legal community that the state will move towards being a state that elects judges. Because this actually is how you end up with activist judges on the bench, right? And that is such an interesting conversation because right now nationally we're having it as Mexico has been moving to elect judges. And so basically all of this to say, look forward to a legislative session that is heavily focused on judicial appointments because something we know about the legislature, they're vindictive. That's how they ended up in this position in the first place. They were mad that the lower court ruled that they overstepped when they ignored a independent redistricting commission that was approved by voters to ensure that there wasn't gerrymandering and cracking and packing in the districting process in this state. The court said they overstepped. So then they wrote this ballot amendment. The court said this ballot amendment's misleading. Like, they fight back. That's what they do. On the note of the legislature continuing to pass constitutionally questionable legislation, did you know, back in the day, not even that long ago, uh, there used to be a requirement that if your bill was unconstitutional. There was a note that said that. It said, <gasps> this this bill is unconstitutional. And then all the lawmakers could take that into consideration when they decide to pass, whether they decide to pass it or not. They got rid of that just a few years ago. And <gasps> I'm wondering if like these are 
these that's this is the ripple effect of that. I I would love to see some data on like how many unconstitutional bills they've passed since removing this constitutional note requirement. This is just something that's been sticking in my craw for months, and I always yeah. forget to bring it up. But just a note on uh, the constitutionality of these bills. I mean, um, do you have a cool million dollars, Emily? Means because you could run a ballot initiative. <laughs> That demands that the legislature <laughs> bring back that practice. And Gail I Miller, think it me. could go well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, listen, it's not my place to dabble in that. But just putting that information out there. Yeah, listen, Allie, mind-blowing. this isn't over until the fat uh-uh. lady sings. The legislature will surely appeal this to the Utah Supreme Court, which takes us back where we started. Um, and I'm just really so curious to see how this all plays out for us. For what it's worth, I still think in my mind, if I'm getting a ballot in the mail in about a month here, I would not vote willy nilly on this amendment. I would still vote my conscience on this amendment just in case the appeal is successful and it's no longer voided. You know what I mean? Like, don't just Christmas tree it because, oh, it doesn't matter. Assume nothing with the Utah legislature. Still vote your conscience when you get your ballot. And we've got, uh, like I said, more information about this amendment. Uh, We'll link that show in the show notes for y'all. Hey, Salt Lake, prepare to be enchanted this fall. Hale Center Theater proudly presents the U.S. premiere of The Magician's Elephant. Based on the beloved story by Kate DiCamillo, join young Peter as he embarks on an unforgettable adventure filled with hope, magic, and a mysterious elephant who has the power to change everything. Now, I've loved this author since I was a kid. She also wrote Because of Winn-Dixie. I bet you've read it. It's a total banger. And The Magician's Elephant features stunning visuals, including a full-sized elephant puppet, captivating music, and a heartwarming tale. This is a family-friendly experience you won't want to miss. It's date night with the kids. Get your tickets now at hct.org. Discover the magic of the magician's elephant at Hale Center Theater. Salt Lake City residents, your Salt Lake City Council invites you to participate in the annual City Council meeting hosted on the West Side. It is on Tuesday, September 17th at the Sorensen Unity Center. Dinner and entertainment will be provided as a token of appreciation for your attendance. These offsite meetings give you the chance to get face to face with your city council member. They are designed to make it easier for you to participate in local government and share your input. There is so much change happening in this city right now. I know you have an opinion. Whether you're a council meeting regular or a first timer, they're excited to connect with you. Spanish and ASL interpreters will be available to help everyone join the conversation. Okay, that's on Tuesday, September 17th at the Sorensen Unity Center at 13th South and 9th West. Dinner is at 5.30. The meeting starts at 7 p.m. Get all the details at slc.gov slash council. Okay, let's move on because I've brought it up a few times now. Uh, The big debate this week. Oh, my God. Debate of the century. And I, of course, am talking about Utah gubernatorial debate (laughs) on Wednesday night. (laughs) I just love when you say gubernatorial. I I mean, that really gets me going, Allie. (laughs) Listen, I was sitting in front of my television where I was streaming this debate on KUER and thinking... Three male lawyers. Nightmare blunt rotation. (laughs) But was it better than the previous debate? I did not watch the presidential debate this week. Which debate was better? So it really interesting that you asked that question, Emily, because it was in Governor Spencer Cox's closing statement. He said... I hope this debate was better than the one last night. I hope you actually learned something about who we are and what we believe in. And I found that to be sort of the most irksome thing he said, because I was like, why you got to do that? 
Like, why why Classic do you class. have to make this about that? We are all here practicing an interest in good local governance. Just give your closing statement. Like, I just feel like lately he, like, never misses an opportunity to be kind of snarky in a way that feels very not disagree better and also not what he initially ran on. And I, I actually thought he had, like, a pretty solid debate performance, but ending with that, I thought was a real downtone. Yeah. Yeah. But not uncharacteristic for him at this point, and no. especially during this election season. So, mm-hmm. who was on stage? We had Republican Governor Spencer Cox, current governor, uh, his challenger, Representative Brian King. He's a Democrat. And then, wild card, a third guy qualified, J. Robert Latham, a libertarian. And yep. I cannot remember the last time we've had a third party candidate on stage at one of these debates, Allie. For um, governor? No. And the and the way that this is determined is the Utah Debate Commission uh, sends out a poll and asks, like, at this moment, who would you consider voting for? And if you get a, above the threshold, you get to be on stage. And so uh, J. Robert Latham hit that threshold and <laughs> brought <laughs> I don't know, kind of a chaotic energy. Basically, it was like Spencer Cox trying to fend off Brian King's attacks and then Robert Latham over here being like, hey, and by the way, it there are more than two parties. And that's how I would characterize this Oh, my this God. OK, debate. 100%. Having a libertarian in a debate about issues is kind of hilarious because it felt like, of course, one of the core tenets of the Libertarian Party is like anti-big government. Government should be doing less, right? feels very similar to what we heard from Mayor Trent Staggs of of Riverton on this show when we talked to him about local issues. Um, But like there were so many moments where the moderator would be like, okay, let's talk about energy policy. And like Cox would give his energy thing and Brian King would give his energy thing. And then Robert Latham would be like, do less. Next question. Like it was just like his answer was always like less, less. I also love the moment when he goes, let's be clear, bipartisanship doesn't include me. (laughs) Yeah, heard that, heard that. That was an interesting way of framing it. Um, Uh, Memorable, for sure. Topics topics discussed, energy policy, economy, housing, uh, you know, what makes Utah great? <laughs> uh, from Cox, we heard, listen, these are all the great things I've done in the past four years. Here are all the great things I'll continue to do. And Brian King said, no, sir, these things are not great. This is not what the people want. And mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's kind of what we got. Do you think we learned anything new or unexpected from this debate? Not necessarily. I feel like everything I found unexpected about it was in tone. But I will say, to add to like how you're characterizing what we heard from Governor Spencer Cox, I think it was very specifically like everything that's great, which is everything, is things that my administration is doing and encouraging. And everything that's bad is Joe Biden's fault. Like inflation, Joe Radical Biden's Democrats, fault. Radical Democrats, energy environmentalists. Right. The reason that we're not harnessing natural energy more in this state, natural energy production or renewable energy production is because the feds have usurped all the land. And so we don't have land for it was like my understanding of what he was saying, um, that you should vote for the ballot amendment to repeal the food tax in exchange for removing the earmark on education, which is another legislature written sticky wicket here. Um, but that's the way that we as a state are fighting federal inflation. Like it was like, it's not me, it's Joe Biden. I actually think that's a message that might work in Utah, but I don't think it's a very interesting one, given how much power you know a governor has and what a cool job it is to be the governor. And it's frankly a message that he doesn't even need to send. It's not like this state is going to vote for the Democrat in the presidential election, right? Right. Like, we know Utah's going to go for Trump. 
And I mean, I think that's where Brian King was trying to take his shots, right? Like Spencer Cox recently, Brian King's words, flip flopped on his endorsement of Donald Trump, right? Mm -hmm. Cox initially said he wasn't going to vote for either of the candidates. Then he changed his mind and said, you know what, I'm going to vote for Trump. I'm endorsing Trump. And that's really uh, where King was trying to hit Cox and make it hurt. But I was really interested, Allie, actually, in... Brian King's closing statement, Mm. which I believe was for Republicans, right? And I mean, that's what a Democrat needs in this race to win. He needs to bring Republicans over to his side because Republican voters just so outnumber Democratic voters in this state. And uh, I wrote it down. What did he say? Oh, I believe it was, if you had the courage to vote for Nikki Haley. Yes. If you were quietly hoping Donald Trump wouldn't be the nominee, if you had the courage to vote for Nikki Haley, get behind me. And I thought that was really interesting that he specifically spoke to Republicans who he thinks might go for him, but like historically not. Yeah. I have to say on the matter of tone and the reason I keep bringing tone up is because we can all say that we want debates to be thoughtful, contemplative policy arguments. They just really so much are about the sheen and the appearance of the candidates. Um, I would like to advocate for debates being basically encouraged as radio (laughs) exclusively, (laughs) like a pre-Kennedy time when it was just just a radio conversation. But I also think like, let's get rid of the audience. But, you know, Governor Cox came out pretty early with a line that was very memorable, which is we are living in the golden age of Utah. And yet next to where I wrote that quote down in my Apple notes, I wrote three words. Jumpy, defensive, and irked. I thought the governor did not seem calm on stage. I Mm. thought Brian King seemed the most comfortable on stage of all of the candidates. And maybe there is something about just knowing that you're there to be the thorn and like kind of knowing your job and doing it. Um, But for someone who, you know, has so much control in this election and in the media narrative, like you get to be the governor, you get to be the incumbent, he really was jumpier than I'm used to seeing him and and more defensive um, than I'm used to seeing him. The, another thing he said that I really thought of you, Emily, was because, again, look, the reason Thanks. I'm focusing <laughs> on what the governor had to say is because he's probably going to win. And so this is an opportunity to, like, hear what his plans are and hold him accountable. Right. Big density energy. He said, we are going to go vertical like the Jetsons. <laughs> I heard that that too. Yeah. (laughs) And I think, I mean, Spencer Cox is certainly interested in building more housing, right? He talked a lot about his starter homes initiative, 35,000 starter homes. I also uh, was wondering if he would, if he meant Jetsons in terms of like literally flying cars or like transportation technology. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I think that Spencer has laid out his plans for Utah and The thing is, is that they kind of also need to align with the supermajority Republican legislature's plans for Utah. Yeah, he really there was a moment when a student asked a question about Amendment D and he was really kind of that was when he seemed the most jumbled and the the least like clear and practiced in what he was kind of saying. Um, And I think what was going through my mind was like, As someone who's also had your power taken away from the legislature, how are you feeling about this, though, on an emotional level? (laughs) Like, Because the Utah legislature (laughs) loves to override the governor. They love to ignore the governor and remind him that really they're the ones in power here. I want to ask you a question, Emily, and I want you to be honest, not think about how you would answer this question if you were running for office, but how you would answer this question if a friend asked it of you on the street okay Okay. what makes utah great her people (laughs) is how spencer cox answered that um yeah and the other two said freedom i mean inspiring i don't know i guess voters will decide i think those kinds of questions 
Like, it's so transparent when the answer feels rehearsed. We also asked Mayor Erin Mendenhall what made Salt Lake City great, and she said the people. And I just got to be honest, I would absolutely love for a candidate to be like, the breakfast sandwiches, the views, our national parks, that it's base camp, like the kind of things people actually say. (laughs) Something that shows you're connected to the state. Any governor could give that answer anywhere. When my friends call me and are like, why do you still live in Utah? I don't say because of the freedom. (laughs) And I don't say because of her people. (laughs) I say because my mom lives down the street and she would be devastated if I left this state. (laughs) Love you, mom. Hey Salt Lake, back to school is all about looking and feeling your best. Could your skin use a new strategy? Crude has been handcrafting skincare in this valley for a decade. They know what Salt Lakers need. The skin microbiome is vital to its health, but most skincare strips and disrupts your healthy bacteria. Crude takes a different approach with flora-friendly, plant-based ingredients. And right now, and listen up because this is actually crazy, Crude is offering their oil cleansing starter kit completely free to new customers. It is everything you need to rethink your routine in one neat bundle. Just cover the shipping or pick it up locally with no shipping charge. Use code BACKTOSCHOOL on livecrude.com and just pay the shipping. Or visit their store, 824 South, 400 West in Salt Lake City to pick it up locally at no charge. I am telling you, you're going to get $60 worth of products for free. You can also learn more about Crude on Instagram and TikTok at Live Crude. That's at Live Crude. Whenever posture comes up in conversation, we all do that thing where we immediately sit upright and pull our shoulders back. Did you do it just now? I did a movement session with Chandler at Embodied Patients, and after a few gentle corrections, I was surprised to find sitting up straight is incredibly easy. Chandler's practice combines over a decade of study in yoga, Pilates, and the Alexander Technique. So why should you invest in your posture? Let's start with the link between better posture and better breathing. Whether you're returning to activity from an injury, looking to manage pain, or just have the sense things could be a little easier, Chandler will teach you to create sustainable movement habits so that you can enjoy the things you love for longer. Maybe that's running marathons. Maybe it's walking the dog. Visit embodiedpatients.com to book a session with Chandler and give yourself the gift of your own attention. All right, let's go to pick of the week. You want to go first? Yeah, I think this is a really good week for people to, how do they say, touch grass. <laughs> so we need to get outside this week. And one way to do that is to go to the Get to the River Festival on the Jordan River. So mm-hmm. throughout September, a bunch of different organizations and local governments are programming the river, which is really cool. I don't act, I don't know how I didn't know about this prior to this. It's like the 11th year that they've done this festival. Um, but we're talking about tree plantings, nature mm. walks, birding, bike tours. And this Saturday, September 14th, they have some really cool events. There's like a chalk art event. There is an opportunity to catalog wildlife with scientists on the river. That seems like something maybe you would like to do, Ali. I know you're a fan of the beavers on the yes, river. Yes, I've never seen one, but one day. This could be the day. And then there will also be a canoe and kayak trip along the river. So if you're so interested fun. in getting outside and visiting our uh, Emerald Ribbon in Salt Lake County, then I will link the info in the description for you and you can check it out. Can I tell you something I've always wanted to do, Emily? It's get in a canoe at the Great Salt Lake and take the Jordan River all the way down to Utah Lake because the Jordan River famously connects the two. And I wonder if it's possible to do the whole journey. Maybe so, but I think wouldn't you be going upstream? You should probably start at Utah Lake and go down to the Great Salt Lake. You're right, you're right, you're right. Or you're going to have a real real workout. (laughs) Well, you know I do love exercise. (laughs) 
<laughs> so if you see Ali rowing a boat southward on the Jordan River, <laughs> just delirious her yelling tree. about beavers. Yeah, yeah. Please throw beer into the into the canoe. Yeah. What's your pick, Ali? My pick of the week is the scenic Utah photo contest. I think this is really fun. It's your opportunity to take all the best scenic pictures that you've taken in this state since you moved here um, and submit them to Scenic Utah. The winner in each category, so there's six different categories you can submit in, and you can submit up to five photos. The winner in each category gets 100 bucks at a Cotopaxi backpack, which is like worth it to just look through your phone and submit some photos. I do have to give full disclosure here. Scenic Utah, if you're not familiar, listeners of the show know this, is an mm. anti-billboard organization. <laughs> so right, right. I don't know if you would call them like a lobbying group. I don't know what their tax designation is. But they're, they basically are, they're strongly anti-billboard. And Emily, something I think you'll really love about this contest, there's actually an anti-billboard category. <laughs> Oh, my God. So, so the categories are like, you know, night skies, rural Utah, scenic byways, whatever. And then one category is called billboard blunders, outdoor advertising that's spoiling community character and views of the natural world. So you know what? It's pretty funny. If you live in the Post District, just take a nice photo from inside your living room where there's a billboard straight in front of your window and submit that sucker. And this, you might at least get a hundred bucks. You might get at least a little rent discount. Yeah. Julia Reagan billboard at sunset. That's what exactly. I would name that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Name that photo. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. So the contest runs through October 15th. You've got plenty of time to enter. Winners are going to be announced November 1st. Get out there. But know that you'll probably end up on the Scenic Utah email list. <laughs> Fair warning. Thank you, Emily. Have a great weekend. Try not to think about your ballot. Thanks, Allie. <laughs> that is all for us today here on CityCast Salt Lake. Our executive producer is Emily Means. Our producer is Ivana Martinez. Our newsletter editors are Terina Ria and Adrian Gonzalez. And our host is me, Ali Vallarta. Music is by the local band Mitochondria with additional music from All the Kimonos. We will be back Monday morning with more from around this city. Have a great weekend.